Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you and welcome to our kickoff of the 2014 season of Revolutionaries. It's great to see such a huge crowd here tonight. I'm John Holler. I'm the CEO of the museum. And I'm so happy to welcome you on behalf of our board and our staff and our uh, many amazing volunteers. We have a stellar lineup for you this year. And I'm going to tell you just a few of them, uh, not even going to get all the way through June, because I think this, this may be the best revolutionary season yet. First, let me just remind you that major funding for revolutionaries is provided by the Intel Corporation. Yay, bravo. <laughs> Intel has just renewed its support for a sixth consecutive year. That makes them a very, very good friend of the museum. <laughs> and now for tonight's program. For almost five decades, Regis McKenna has been a central figure in Silicon Valley. When he hasn't been busy making history, and he's made plenty of it, he has been a witness to even more. Regis has been a profound influence on the marketing and business strategies for some of the Valley's most notable and successful companies. Companies like Apple, Intel, Genentech, Silicon Graphics, 3Com, and many, many more. Regis's career began in the early days of semiconductors, and it extends right through to the many startups that he advises today and serves on many boards of. His firm, Regis McKenna Incorporated, launched wave after wave of technology companies, and many of the strategic marketing ideas that we consider commonplace today were ideas that Regis initiated from scratch. He was close to and deeply influential in the early career of Steve Jobs, but Jobs is just one of dozens of major figures in the Valley and in computing who have relied on him as an advisor and a friend. He serves on a large number of corporate and nonprofit boards. He's a prolific writer, and he is the source of some of the best stories that could ever be told about Silicon Valley and its history. With him tonight to walk us through some of those great stories is John Markoff of the New York Times, who has almost as much history under his own belt and is a friend and frequent moderator for, here, uh, for us here at the museum, as many of you know. So please join me in welcoming Regis McKenna and John Markoff. Good evening. <laughs> when I was a young reporter, uh, starting out in Silicon Valley, which for me was the 1970s, um, Regis McKenna was everywhere. Regis McKenna, the public relations company, and uh, that meant that if you were writing about uh, a new startup or if you were writing about an influential company, uh, you would in end up engaging with Regis. And, uh, but there was more to the puzzle. And I have two very clear memories that I wanted to, to start uh, with, uh, to share with you. Uh, one was in New York, I think it was 1983. Um, John Scully had just come to Apple and he was making what I think was his first appearance uh, with Wall Street. He, and he was in New York, and uh, Scully was this very articulate new CEO from, from Pepsi, and uh, he was doing a great job. I think Apple was sort of rolling at that point. And at one point, I looked around at the back of the room, and there was Regis, just kind of watching. And I thought about that, that's interesting. And um, dial it all the way forward uh, to 2009, and it was Steve Jobs' last sort of great uh, business crisis. If you all remember Antennagate, uh, Steve had been in Hawaii, he had, he had rushed back because you know, there was problems with the particular iPhone, and uh, he did a great job. Uh, he diffused the crisis, um, he sort of engaged on the issue, and uh, the press conference was over, it was held at Infinite Loop, and I turned around and there was Regis <laughs> standing in the back. And, uh, I think that's part of the puzzle that I want to get to tonight, but um, that's not where I want to start. Uh, you grew up in Pittsburgh, right. and I was thinking about Pittsburgh in the early 60s, and if it was about technology and media, I might have gone east instead of west. How did you end up in Silicon Valley? Well, I, I was going to school um, in, the, um, in the late 50s, and I went to Duquesne University in Pittsburgh. and um, and uh, went out looking for a job after, after I wouldn't say I graduated, that's a whole other story. But um, <laughs> um, 
I went out looking for a job, and there weren't many jobs in Pittsburgh. This, don't forget, Pittsburgh was the steel capital of the world. It was the, it was the old industries, and it was dying. And not only that, but they were talking about you know really re remodeling the city, of doing away with all the steel mills and, and converting it to new industries. And so there literally wasn't a lot of jobs around, and I had looked and looked and looked, and I, I had gotten married early, yeah, very young, and um, needed a job. And um, uh, I, 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 the one job I applied for, I actually had two, one acceptance, but that was with a small steel company as an office manager. And the other one was with a, a publisher called uh, Instruments Publishing Company. And it was, it was owned by the Rimback family. Uh, Richard Rimback was the founder. He founded Automation Magazine in 1911. He, uh, he had a magazine in the, night, in the late 50s called Medical Electronic News. He was a very forward thinker about all sorts of things, and he wanted an assistant uh, to help him just do lots of things, and uh, he taught me the publishing business. On the West Coast? On the, on, in Pittsburgh. In, oh, in Pittsburgh. In Pittsburgh. Okay. And, um, and um, uh, they, they, were, they wanted to open a West Coast direct office uh, to sell space, and um, they, they had, he didn't like, he, his son was the sales manager, and they always fought. And he didn't want to send one of the young Turks out to the West Coast that he couldn't control the father. And so um, uh, the daughter said, uh, they were giving them tests. And I said, well, I took, a, I took psychology. I know how to take these tests. <laughs> and uh, I took the test. And, and it turns out I passed the, whatever I had to do. And so they asked me to move to the West Coast. But was that sort of journalism at that point? What would you? What no, was, I, was, was I was a little bit of everything. Like? I was, uh, you, you essentially, you got in the releases, you rewrote them, you did copy editing, um, you, you proofread all the, the articles, you worked with the engineers. It's a small staff. It was in an old, the old Oliver mansion. So it was uh, probably 20 people in the whole company. And it, was it because the electronics and aerospace industry was starting to pick up? on the West Coast that you went there to build that business? Was that the Yes, connection? when I came out here um, in 1963, there was, um, uh, there was enough, actually even in the instrumentation world, there was Varian and HP, and, um, and they were using reps then, and they wanted more direct involvement, thought they could grow that business. You ever think about that branch point? What, what would have happened if you'd gone to work for the steel company? Uh, well, I, I, it's a joke, but it was called the, the steel company was called Lawrenceville Screw Company. So I think I, I think I, I think I think the choice was easy. <laughs> Can you imagine that on my business card? <laughs> Read to some stuff. Lawrenceville Screw Company. <laughs> so uh, was was there was there any t in growing up? Did you have any contact with technology, or did that come? No, but I, you know, I, I, I really enjoyed the science classes in college. I took a number of them, uh, physics and, and so forth, and I really, really loved them. Yeah. And so I had some, some. Uh, the, the, what happened at, at Rimback was, in, you know, he was a pretty, he was a hard driving man. So you had to know the business, and of course, reading the articles and rereading everything that was going on. I got, you, you've got these releases on new products from people on the West Coast. Companies like Varian and, and HP, uh, Fairchild, then also as well. Um, so you know, trying not that I understood any of it, but you had to work with it in some way. And I had enough technical people who were editors that you could talk to, yeah. and who could teach you. So in in Walt, Walter uh, Isaacson's book Jobs, he refers to you as a college dropout. I take it that you would take issue with that uh, sure. characterization. Yeah, um, I, I graduated with 192 credits. So um, I was taking lots and lots of courses all the time at college, and I had a dispute with the college over uh, taking a survey course. And Duquesne University wanted me to take that survey course, and when I moved out here, I, I, I took it out here, and they said, no, we won't accept that. So we had a dispute, which eventually was resolved. But um, it, it, I, I, I worked, even when I started my company, I was going back to school to try to get that degree. We'll come back to Walter Isaacson's yeah, book, yeah. but, but um, uh, when you arrived here, what did you find? What, what was going on here? What was the flavor of Santa Clara County, not Silicon Valley at that point? Yeah, um, you know, th there was a relatively few companies, and they were pretty far. I mean, I, I had the northeast or the northwest 
So I went up to Seattle and Portland and places like that. And there were aerospace companies that you would, you would call on. People um, advertising accelerometers and things of that nature. And, and there, was a, there were startups here. There were people, I mean, Ampex was here. So they were, on, they were sort of one of the companies that was the most hopeful in terms of being a big, large market for consumer or type products. Um, and there were smaller companies that were spin-offs of mostly Ampex. Um, there was a tube company here, uh, uh, Itel McCullough, still manufactured uh, electron tubes. And um, so, you know, calling on these companies was, was, it was a great education. And I would go in, ask for all their literature first, take that home. I subscribed to all the magazines and I would just literally put them out on the floor and try to understand what I, you know, try to learn what I could about their business and about, and do some research. Was there a definable electronics industry that you were in the midst of or it was? No, not really. Um, you know, the, the, the spin-offs in the semiconductor industry, I think, really created that Fairchild. And that really started happening probably in, in the mid to late 60s. Yeah. Did you bump into integrated circuits? The integrated circuit had been invented. It was... No, not at all. Not at all. And in fact, um, I think you know that whenever I showed you when, when I went to National and when I went to General Microelectronics before that, um, my first promotions were doing this thing. No one's going to be able to see this. Yeah. <laughs> That's a single transistor. It's epoxy. It's an epoxy transistor. Do you remember what it sold for by any chance? Uh, probably a few cents. I can tell you that at GME, um, there was on the, on the um, sales forecast every year, there was a, a line that said uh, bunny eyes. And, um, and as, as transistors were waning you know, as, as a market force, the, uh, and you know, with the, the integrated circuit taking over um, the, the markets, um, they were selling them to toy manufacturers who would insert these into the bunnies because if you look at them, it's epoxy with a black top and a white around the bottom and then two leads. <laughs> so they, so they, they were actually selling them for two cents a piece to the, to the Asian toy manufacturers and probably made more money than they did selling them as transistors. Um, and so uh, did you come right to Sunnyvale? Have you always been a... No, where, where we, you... we lived in, we started, I think when we first moved here, we lived in Belmont, and, but then you know, moved down to Sunnyvale very, very early. And so it wasn't long before you jumped to this new chip company. Did you call them chip companies? No, then? I, 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 um, I didn't like you know, selling space. And, I, and the reason, quite frankly, it was a really definite reason, and it was that people had expectations for the advertising. And, and, um, and, and you know, they would literally run a few ads because the, and I, a couple small companies that I met because they expected to be saved. And I was kind of talking them out of it more than I was selling. And so I didn't like that. So I went to work for actually a small agency for a very short period of time. Advertising. Yeah. yeah. And, and convinced them to get off of the, um, the uh, um, commission basis because you would sell ads and then you'd take 15% commission as your income and go on a fee system and help companies do everything. Help them package their whole marketing strategy. And... Um, and um, while I was sort of, and we did that on a few companies and it was working very well, I was driving around Santa Clara and I saw one of those tilt-ups. And every day I would go by there, it was getting more and more finished. And when I saw people moving in, I pulled over and went in and asked who the VP of marketing was. And it was Earl Gregory, who was um, Electronic Arrays. Um, and, um, oh no, it was uh, General Microelectronics, nice. I'm sorry. Yeah. He later found it was Electronic Race um, and General Microelectronics, and I pitched him, and he said, "Fine, let's let's work together." So then, about six months later, he said, "Why don't you come inside and do that?" And that's how I got into GME. Was he a fair a fair children? He was he was a, from Raytheon. I was from Raytheon. He was okay. from Raytheon. But but every, most, all the other people were from Fairchild. And were and you was, aware of that sort of diaspora at that point? I mean, is, you already have a sense that there was this. Well, Fairchild was a, was, was a dominant force by then. I mean, they, they were probably the most prolific advertiser in the Valley at that time because I, I think looking back at, at this, both the, sort of the advertising and the PR played a different role in the 60s and the 70s and even on in, in, into the middle of the 80s in that the engineers actually read these magazines. 
um, <laughs> and and they, um, they 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 did a lot of comparison shopping among the art, and you would write an article and you'd make a, there were a lot of benchmarks that were published, and so there be people actually did look at this stuff and make decisions from it, and um, and it was a way in which your salespeople got leads as to where to make that next call because the industry was pioneering. There was they were looking for new markets all the time and they expanding it and and the, the trade magazines were a, a way to reach in, into people and give them sort of that educational basis. So I mean one of the I mean, every company I was with from GME to the starting it and then national and others was to start a technical writing program which we hired a lot of technical writers and got it, you know, incentive, paying incentive to the engineers to work with them to write articles. In that very early period, what were the magazines that mattered? Was electronics around? Electronics was there, uh, electronic design, um, systems design. Uh, it was uh, mostly design type magazines. Yeah. Was there any newspaper? Oh, electronic any? news. Uh, that they, they, they had the Women's Wear Daily was their most popular newspaper. <laughs> and so that then was to do a daily news. But so they, they were actually newspaper people who covered the electronics industry. And that's where Don Heffler worked. He was a sort of the Luella Parsons of the of the yeah. high tech world. I, I, let me jump ahead a little bit because I, I read some, you know, Huffler coined the term Silicon Valley, but I've heard since that the, the term was in common use before he was credited with putting it in print. Is, is, that, is that your memory? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it didn't hurt that at the time, Carl Dodo was popular. <laughs> <laughs> it took a second, sorry. <laughs> Oh dear, oh dear. I'm serious. Oh, we'll come back to uh, this, 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 So, so there was a lot of, um, it, 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 you know. But but Don used it popularly. I have I have his early newsletter. Uh, you know, when he mentions it, he he, um, and and it was largely because he, you know he covered the semiconductor industry and he talked about who was changing jobs, who had what position, who was going to start up something new, um, who was suing whom. Uh, all, the, all of the sort of gossipy stuff. I mean, there, were, there was very little substance to, you know, from a technical standpoint. Do you remember when the... I, I can tell you that his boss um, in, in New York, um, and I'm missing his name right now, but uh, he, he, he used to call me all the time and, and check up on Don. <laughs> <laughs> and I would go back to New York, and, and uh, he was a newspaper man too, but he never quite trusted him on what he was getting or what real, he was doing. Was it real what he was saying? Was it true? And so forth. So, so um, in what juncture did it start to, did the notion of Silicon Valley start to leak out of the valley? There was a period, there was uh, probably 76, some New York Times reporter came out and did a three-part series. Is, do you remember? Well, what, the, was the, there the person who? I mean, a couple of people were, were, were doing. Uh, Gene Belinsky was yeah. probably a very early Fortune. person for Fortune magazine, yeah. and he was doing large, in-depth kinds of articles, um, and and did very, very good, good journalistic research on his articles. What? What? I mean, one of the things, and, and this is where I think maybe you know our firm had something to do with this because I started doing this at National, um, and at GME, and that was. Um, there was there was no West Coast news offices. The 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 news the people who were who were in Time Magazine or whatever out here, even the Wall Street Journal, Business Week, they were science editors and they covered pharmaceuticals. They covered big industries, so there were no electronic journalists that really were active in the Valley um, or, in fact, in San Francisco. And and in fact, the 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 um, New York uh, the Wall Street Journal would not write an article on a company that was not listed on the New York Stock Exchange until about 1983. So startups had no chance. Um, and I can remember talking to a guy, uh, an analyst about Intel back in, in the late 70s um, at uh, Morgan Stanley, and he told me there's, there's none of those West Coast companies interest us. There's only one company that matters in the electronics industry, and that's IBM. And so I have a lot of those kinds yeah. of story, uh, memorabilia from people who wrote me letters on that. Uh, Forbes magazine asked me to take them off the mailing list. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I'm having the same problem I have with Trip Hawkins. We're halfway through and we're still at 1975. Yeah. So I'm a little worried about <laughs> okay. that. Okay. Get, no, no, it's not your fault. It's, it's, um, but I did want to ask you, you know, 
there were characters in the semiconductor industry, and you know, we remember, I mean, we know Jobs and Waz well, but the guys, I mean, the Charlie Sporks and the Jerry Saunders, but I was also thinking about guys like Bob Wadler, Weidler. 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 And, and Dave Talbert. Dave Talbert. Anything you can say about yeah, the guys who are I mean, engineers? Bob, Bob actually, um, I, I mean, I, it, it sounds strange, Bob was a friend. Um, he was a genius designer. Uh, if, he made Fairchild successful. He, he designed probably 80% of the, the linear devices that actually still are based on his designs. Um, he, he, would, he, he, he was a real strange character. If he were here, he'd have to have a glass of gin. Uh, he talked, I mean, we would have engineers in Paris by the hundreds show up. I mean, literally, I mean, that sounds a lot, but in those days, hundreds and hundreds of engineers would show up to listen to him talk um, on design. And Talbert was his process guy. And the two of them were, wouldn't, wouldn't tell you what they were doing. The wider would just show up one day with a new product, you know, and he'd have the, the, the devices in a, in a, in a box and he'd have the data sheet, and he'd have all the information and say, here. And, um, and he would disappear. He would get on an airplane and just no one would find him for, for weeks, and you wouldn't know what he was doing. Uh, he kept an ax in his office. Uh, one story was uh, I brought the guy in from, the, from a data sheet who was making data sheets, uh, um, and, and the guy's name was Roger, and, and Bob was, was after lunch, so Bob was pretty much out of his mind. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and Bob was trying to take this data sheet apart and he had it stapled and he couldn't do it. And the guy said, why don't you use your ax? And Bob said, good idea. And he did. <laughs> and, and I never saw that guy again. I mean, <laughs> he left. Now, now there's a bit of legend about a goat or a sheep. I guess there's something. Yeah, it was a goat. Charlie, Charlie was, was bare bones. He always said, you know, you can have mahogany on your office walls or you can have them at home. And so he didn't spend any money on, uh, on you know, the exterior or interior, do the, you know, basically as, as bare bones as you can. This is Charlie Spork. Charlie Spork. Yep. And, um, and he, so the grass just kept growing in front and it wasn't very pretty and so forth. And Bob bought a goat and changed it to the, to, chained it to the front of the building. <laughs> and it was out there when Charlie came to work in the morning. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, that was, <laughs> So another part of that culture that I've heard about but don't really know about uh, revolved around the wagon wheel and the bold night. Yeah. Did you get? Did did you go to? Was did everybody go? Was the entire yeah after work there? you 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 went to the, either the wagon wheel or the the bold night and it is where it it, it was where more probably like uh, the technology transfer occurred and than, <laughs> than, than, than one could imagine yeah. um, simply because people gathered there from competitors and talked about what they were doing. And that's where probably most of the semiconductor companies, and there was, as you know, a plethora of them that, that you know, happened in the 1960s and 70s, probably got all, all got their start there at the Bold, Bold Night was a little bit upscale. <laughs> um, but they were both kind of hard drinking establishments. Hard drinking right? establishments, yes. Was there food? Yeah, there was food, but. You, it was a second it, it, That was a, yeah. yeah. So uh, somebody said that you changed jobs from GME to National just by driving in a different driveway, which was Well, GME was acquired by Philco, uh, Philco Ford. And, um, um, and um, uh, National just opened their doors across the street, and I got a call from, from Don Valentine. And when I went over there, the building was completely empty. Uh, Spork and Valentine were pitching pennies against the wall. Uh, there was no equipment, no nothing. We, and then they had a, an operation on the East Coast that they had, were shutting down, and that had transistors in it and some uh, transistor devices. Uh, Spork built the, the storage cage. We come, in on a, we come in on a weekend, and at National, we, he, he was a, he's a good carpenter, and he built, uh, we built the cages in, uh, in the storerooms. And... Um, and you know the employees actually, you know, it was a very small company. You told me a story about GME where you would proofread the ROM code. Is that was it yeah. that small? That was yeah. a small operation yeah. too. Yeah, I mean, GME was a marvelous education for me. It was my my MBA probably because um, the company, these small semiconductor companies, did everything and they made all their own equipment, and they grew the ingots. Um, I could I should have brought one tonight. I still have it. It's a three quarter inch ingot, um, and. Um, and they sliced them, polished them, 
you know, did all the, the cut the mylar masks, did all the camera work. Um, yeah, everything was done internally, and then later on, they actually were making calculators. So you could see the ingot to a calculator and learn the whole process. Plus, it was probably, I don't, I don't think they ever got beyond 10 million as a company, and so you knew everybody in the company, and if you had a question, or you could, you could literally walk, all you had to do was put on a white smock, there was no such thing as a clean room. And, um, and the it, fab line was right, was right there? Yeah, everything was right yeah. there, everything. Yeah. And so learning the process, learning what it's all about, seeing, it, 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 it kind of reminds me when Bob Noyce used to talk about the automobile, that you know, when he was a kid, you could see the pistons, you could understand how this worked, or you could look in the back of a radio, and you could see the, you know, how everything was sort of happening around the tubes. And, and eventually things become encapsulated and you don't see them anymore. But in those days, you saw the whole process laid out before you. And then you saw what it did in, in the end by applying it into something like a calculator. You stayed at National a relatively short period of time and set out on your own. Yeah. Was that an entrepreneurial urge? What, I mean, were you in just the Silicon Valley tradition at that point? Or what caused you to jump so quickly? Yeah, um, National, again, was a wonderful experience. Don Valentine and Spork were ter terrific. I mean, a lot of, they were very, very tough bosses. But I, I just uh, learned so much from both of them. And Don, as I was also mentioning to you, just sent me around the world. He didn't want me to see me in my office. So most people who are doing what we call marketing services, you know, are inside busy doing things. I got some people to do that, and he wanted me out doing, meeting with salespeople, meeting with distributors, meeting with customers, and understanding things from the, from the outside in. But this, this is interesting, this was as a, as a marketing guy, not yeah. as a sales guy, you were still traveling the world. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. And, and, uh, and Don was the guy who sort of, I don't know if he, he developed that whole idea of hiring application engineers to work in the field offices. They, they, they were not allowed to do any pricing, they weren't allowed to do any you know, delivery or any, any specs on anything other than get the products designed and work with the customer. So he was very forward in his thinking in terms of marketing. But in the semiconductor business, you were sort of yet introducing another linear device. And um, I had, uh, at GME, there was a fellow named Walt Andrews who went to work at, um, for Howard Bob at AMD. Um, and, um, and he always wanted me to come and work for them. And so he kept calling me and asking me, offer, and Howard Bob kept calling. Offer. He was another ex-Fairchild guy that was running, who founded the place. And, um, and, and I kept turning them down. And finally, I said, well, I'll tell you if, and I gave them a number, if you pay me this fee, I'll do it as a consultant rather than in your company. And so I, um, and I, I, I had a, I had a, a salary, <laughs> and uh, so I resigned. I, Valentine said, you can resign as long as you hire your replacement. I hired my replacement, and I went over. I got a call from Walt telling me to come over there one night after work, and I went over, and uh, it turns out that Howard and Walt had never told the COO about this arrangement. <laughs> and so they, I'm sitting in Walt's office, and I hear these guys screaming and yelling <laughs> and fighting and cursing and... And I got up and left. And so I went home and Walt calls me that evening and he said, you know, where'd you go? I said, if you think I'm going to get in the middle of that, you're crazy. So I had uh, essentially uh, an exit without no <laughs> first few possibilities. And, and um, I, um, I went back to see my old friend Earl Gregory, who was at Electronic Arrays. He said he didn't need help, but he sent me to Zev Drury, who was the founder of Monolithic Memories. Um, he loved the fact that I came from National and could tell him all my secrets, all the secrets. <laughs> um, and, um, and I told him I couldn't do it. I needed two clients, and he'd have to convince Earl. So he, he, he basically went to Earl, and so I started off with two clients instead of one. And at that point, it was pure advertising. Is that no, no, no. We did everything. We oh. did. We did the. Uh, we had design. We did research. I. You know, I, knew, I helped Zev with distributors. I mean, we, okay. you, you, I always said we did whatever made a client successful, if, if you know, in, in terms of helping them develop. Because, so, you, again, you're a small company. We were small, they were small. And if you had some expertise that you could help them with, you did it. So right from the beginning, it's sort of like outsourced marketing. Is that what you yeah, call exactly. it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Interesting. And there were lots of companies that did that because they started it with engineering basis, and they didn't start with, with a marketing department. So... 
um, within a few years, I had nine semiconductor companies as clients, all these little spin-offs. All not competing with each other. Uh, they all said they weren't. <laughs> <laughs> How did Intel find you? Um, and who? who, who well, uh, that's another interesting story. I, I, when I, at National, there was a fellow named Don Coburn. Don just passed away about six months ago, lived here in Palo Alto for many, many years. And Don was an assistant to Bob Noyce. He was also an assistant to Charlie Spork at National. And um, he, um, I, I, he, 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 was, he was sort of a, a finance guy, but also a good research guy. And as my company was growing, I, you know, was, we were moving pretty fast. I needed somebody to do the finances as well as the research. So I asked Don, who I befriended at National, to come. He got a call from Bob Noyce asking um, uh, him if he would do some plant location work, which he had also done for Fairchild, because um, they were looking for a plant up in Portland. And Don told him, no, I'm working with Regis now. I don't want to do that. And I, he told me this. And I said, you call him back, <laughs> and you tell him that you will do it, but I want to have dinner with Noyce. And uh, Ed Gelbach. Um, it was the VP of marketing, so um, Ed and Bob and Don and I had dinner down in San Jose and uh, in a wine cellar down there, and I pitched them, and the next day, Ed Gelbeck called me back and said, we want to go. And at that point, Intel was a, they were not a broad consumer company. It was a very different beast. Oh, than at, at that time, you know, in 19, this was roughly 71, uh, in 71, you know, the 4004 and then the 8008 was on, there. it's probably 70, 71, 72. Um, and, and as well as, um, you know, the, the first semiconductor memory, the, the first RAM was not announced, we announced that. Um, yeah, it was before RAMs. When did the watches come in? The watches came much later, I think, probably in the, in the late 70s. So there were microprocessors. But the whole idea was, again, because of, you know, looking at uh, the volume drivers, that the watch, that the electronics in the watch would be a volume driver. Because there was a lot of companies. Remember, National was in games, and, and everybody got into watches, and all the semiconductor companies. They were looking for something to, prove, to get volume. And um, so the, the, everybody got into those, those sorts of things. It, the story about the watch is the Microma watch. I still have one at home. I've never took it out of the box. It weighs a ton if I was sitting here. It's, uh, it's a big, thick watch. It's L, L, uh, LCD. And, um, uh, and, and Andy Grove wouldn't spend a million dollars because we said we needed a new designer. You needed a, because watches were jewelry. People wear watches as jewelry. They don't wear them as, as uh, a piece of electronics. Yeah. And, um, and so, uh, but you know, later on he spent more than a million to, to advertise, so. So do you think Sil Silicon Valley will finally get it right with the iWatch? <laughs> 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 oh, I, you know, I don't know anything about the iWatch. <laughs> but your point about jewelry, they... they yeah, yeah, I mean, it, well, you know, I guess Apple hired this designer yeah. uh, and, um, you know, out of the, the you know, design industry in, in Europe. And, um, but, you know, designing products is always, I mean, now they've become part of your household and, and so forth. I often wondered why the PC industry... That, that Apple was the only one that took design as a serious aspect of their product. And, um, and certainly it gave them a premium on their products. There's one great bit of Intel history that I wanted to ask you about. It seems like one of those important junctures was Operation Crush. Yeah. And you were deeply woven into Operation Crush and that sort of led IBM to pick Intel as, I mean, was, uh, that, that's why they didn't go to Motorola or to Zilog, is that? Well, was that what, what what, uh, what happened, and there are people in the audience here I know, like Dave House, who can correct me on this and, and do. Um, but um, uh, in fact, we just had our crush reunion, what, about uh, three months ago. And uh, there, there was um, an issue where Intel was losing designs um, to Motorola, who had come out with a 68,000 processor, and that most people saw as, as a pretty advanced processor. I remember talking to um, the, the head of microelectronic design at GE, and he said, you know, those little companies that are, that are using the 68,000 are capturing our imagination. So this, the companies were moving away from Intel, and, um, and there was a um, um, salesman on the East Coast who, uh, Casey Powell, 
I believe, who, who had written a letter uh, start, you know, into Grove and others trying to warn him about this. So Grove finally called a meeting of, um, of internal staff meeting and, um, and there was, I believe, seven or nine people that he selected to, to be part of this crush group to go away and come up with a, an outline for a, for a strategy to, to beat Motorola. And um, Jim Lally, I think, was a product manager, and he's the one I think came up with the crush name. The, no lawyers didn't want us to use that, uh, obviously. <laughs> but um, it was an extensive program that, that if, if you think about what was happening at that time, the, 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 the Japanese were taking over the memory business. So the memories were essentially becoming um, uh, cheaper and cheaper. So Intel's margins on memories collapsed to, to zero. And yet the microprocessor had yet to take off because the, the, you know, the volume applications like the IBM PC was until about 1983. And so you had this juncture of getting out of one business or dying business and trying to take on a new. And there was, for a period of time, a, 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 you know, a difficult decision to make as to whether or not you abandon one and go to the other. And there was a lot of debate internally. The memory people were... Um, you know, we're pretty, uh, you know, nervous about what was going to happen. The microprocessor people were very optimistic. But the crush group, I think, put together sort of, it put the whole company together. It, it involved every aspect of the company, from design, from partnerships, from uh, sales and distribution, from major customer. Uh, we, we looked at every marketplace, aligned every, uh, the top customers in each of them, we did specific targeted presentations to every one of them. Uh, you reported every Wednesday you came in and, and gave a presentation on whether or not you accomplished your tasks that you were supposed to from the previous week. And this gets at my point starting off. You weren't an Intel employee. Right. And you were doing this. Right. That, to me, that still seems like an unusual relationship. Lucky. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you were sort of there, you were playing a marketing role at at that point? Well, I did spend a lot of time at, too. I used to spend my sort of half my day at Intel and half my day at, at, at Apple. And the strange thing is that I was, you know, working to get IBM business and Apple was a competitor yeah. that was, so I, I was on both sides of the fence here. Um, but uh, yeah, I was, and I was on Apple's executive staff. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll get to that. I, but, but, but before I get to, to Steve, I, so a, a general sense, I, one of the things you said that I, uh, that I really like is you said that Silicon Valley is an attitude, not a place. Yeah. What did you mean? Well, I, you know, I mean, we think of it as a geographic place, but I, I used to think, for example, or, you know, that companies like Lockheed were not part of it, but they're geographically here. Um, we have, you know, IBM research has been here, but they're not really a part of what we think of as Silicon Valley. Um, there are companies like Varian that have been around a long time, never really considered a part. Um, HP is borderline. Uh, they've been sort of in and out of it. Uh, more in it, I think, in recent years, and, and certainly in the past, they, they, they were not part of it. Because Silicon Valley, in, in my mind, was, you know, was modeled on the original spin-out of Shockley. It was um, a group of very, very bright young people who decided that they weren't being heard enough that they had an idea of how to do something in their way. And it wasn't just an idea about building uh, a different kind of product. It was also about how to build an egalitarian environment where um, everybody who had something worth saying could say and contribute. And that you were based upon you know, a meritocracy rather than on hierarchy. And Shockley had come out of the East Coast and most of the the older companies that were here were built on this top down. And so this new kind of way in which you, 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 you were really free to explore lots and lots of your own ideas. I mean, and you saw that, I think, at, at just, you know, at Intel, because the, the product marketing managers there were all entrepreneurs. And actually, so many of them have become really entrepreneurs, right? And, and um, and, and they really were in charge of running and putting this together. And it, it was a fascinating place and an active place, very, very busy all the time and very demanding. How uh, fragile or sustainable do you think 
this ecosystem is. Do you, do you fear for the valley, having seen? Yes and no. I think that the, 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 the valley, um, you know, I, I think it's a, a culture of innovation in which, you know, there's a lot of technology transfer that occurs over, it's still over lunches or just people changing jobs. It's all, that's, that's the most prolific, quite frankly, technology, even though people sign all kinds of legal agreements, quite frankly, you can't cut people's heads off. And, and, and so that continues. The, the, um, the venture capital community has changed in various ways and shapes and forms, but it kind of adapts to the industry. There's more angels and the bigger companies have become larger second, third uh, round. Um, and so the angel investors who are probably ex-entrepreneurs, there's more in, you, you don't just invest money, you invest knowledge. Most of these companies that are, that are successful have people who have been, uh, come out of the industry or have, you know, or are senior people in the industry, so they can go on boards. So they're reinvesting knowledge along with money. And uh, you think about the numbers of people who, yeah, this is a huge million dollar, uh, multi-millionaire environment, but everybody still works. And, and those that, that so, quote, retire actually become advisors, guidance, counselors, uh, who knows what psychologists so Bill for. Bill Krauss just came back to work at uh, Anderson yeah. Horowitz. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so I, I think that's true. But on the other hand, the, the, the Valley is more diverse. It's diverse people-wise. It's diverse technology, which diverse technologies always add to something new and something different when they're combined. So there's a lot of diversity here. Um, I think that, that um, the, the difficult thing is can you keep up the sort of mutual networks that are necessary to sustain the kind of transfers of knowledge and, and information that's necessary to sustain this valley? You've been asked a million times, but what did you think when Steve Jobs showed up in your office? Um, Steve went to Intel and asked them who was doing their work and they re referred me me. Um, I had, uh, I guess, had a, he had a hard time getting to me because we were growing pretty rapidly too and we were a relatively small company. Um, but uh, I finally saw both he and Wozniak, they had come in and uh, Steve had a Ho Chi Minh beard, he had cutoffs and Birkenstocks, uh, long hair down his back. Uh, Wozniak was reasonably dressed but not too much different. Um, and uh, the, what they wanted to do was for me to place an article for them that Woz was going to write on the Apple II. It, it, it hadn't written it yet, but he, was in, he had drafted it. And, um, and I looked at it and I said, I'll have to rewrite it. And, they didn't, and Steve Wozniak didn't like yeah, that. Yeah, you rubbed Steve Wozniak the wrong way and you hit it off yeah. with Steve Jobs. Yeah. Which is not what I would have expected. Yeah, and, um, and because uh, I, I had, John Doerr had had, was working on a single board computer at Intel. And six months before this, uh, we had run an ad in Byte Magazine showing uh, Ricky Kawaguchi, whose father worked at HP, and we sold single board computers, bubble packed them, and put them in Byte shops, or, uh, the two stores that they had. And, and we were trying to get Intel into that business, John Doerr, and, and I was working with him on that. The S100 bus, at CPM yeah, machine, yeah, classic. And, and it was just, and we'd write a little application note and how to build things and that sort of thing. So it was a very simple kind of thing. Um, but it was, a, it was a Heath kit, you know, uh, for all practical purposes. So it wasn't strange to me what, what, what that world was about, what they were talking about. But I had, I had even talked to uh, Dan McMillan, who was publisher of McGraw-Hill, because he was thinking of buying Byte Magazine. And he had asked me, and I said, you should turn it into a consumer magazine. Because this, if this market's going to grow, it's got to, it, it can't just sell to hobbyists. So um, that's the discussion I had, and Wozniak didn't want me to do that. And I said, well, there's nothing further I can do for you. So I showed them the door. Um, and uh, Steve called back uh, probably 40 times that, that <laughs> night. <laughs> uh, and uh, we met. We talked about what the future could look like. And... Um, and uh, we, we became friends, and uh, I have, uh, I think I showed you the, I wrote out the first marketing plan in December of 1976, um, in which it's about eight pages. Um, 
Was there anything? Is there, I haven't had a chance to read it yet. Is there no, anything there, Well, the only thing that's in there is in distribution channels, and I have Apple stores. <laughs> <laughs> Vindication, but what I didn't know, what you told me, is there were Apple stores before there were Apple stores. Yeah, there, there was I'm Apple stores. I, I had actually presented this to Apple a couple times because they had very, and it's it makes a lot, it's logical sense. The, the the you know IBM was growing by leaps and bounds, and and by '83 they were they had I think sold over a million units, and um, and so the, all the software companies were going where the volume was. So um, my, I took my father-in-law into um, um, one of the computer stores, and we got him a, a, an Apple uh, when he was 80th birthday. And he comes back, and he's got this, all these things, all these golf and, and all this kind of stuff with him. It's, it was all PC-based. We said, you know, <laughs> Bill, you've got to put all this back. None of that good works on the Apple. And the, and the Apple software kept shrinking. So in an effect, they, they were losing their distribution channels um, and, and and IBM was dominating those, so it, it was sort of inevitable. And I, I had talked about putting stores in different parts of the country. Um, I, had, I actually drew a map and put the, where I thought the stores should be. But the first wave of stores that I didn't know about, they weren't customer facing, were they? They were big no, customer facing. They, they, were, they were actually, the biggest problem were that they were put them in industrial parks. And, and, but there was, the, the dealers had franchises, and so there was always this fear of stepping on a, the, the franchise toes. And, um, um, and so, you know, getting it done, and then they, they spent a lot of money. I think they were spending like a million dollars in these stores. And, and the whole idea was them to be sort of a corporate sales, um, application centers, training centers, all those kinds of things, and then gradually move into retail. Mike Scott was still CEO in that? Who was running No, the no. Um, this was later on. This later. was probably uh, um, no. Uh, Chuck Bosenberg was the was the yeah. marketing guy right. at the time. Yeah, yeah. He came out of IBM. So, is it really true that you had an, an opportunity to have twenty percent of Apple? Um, <laughs> Don Coburn, whom I mentioned before, had said to Steve Jobs, "You know, we'll do all your work for twenty." for 20% or some percent of the company. And he wrote him a letter on that. And, um, um, I, you know, and I said no. And, um, and I, I have a good reason for this. Um, <laughs> largely because how do you distribute that kind of ownership to employees in a private company? Um, and, um, and also, I had an opportunity to do that with a lot of companies at that time, almost every client we could have done work for free, except that you then had to pay salaries, and I was a growing small company struggling with payroll. Right. Um, and, um, and I bought my stock from Steve, uh, who sold it to me. And, um, and, and so I, I did invest in clients. Yeah. You know, there's a bit of Apple's history that I've never really completely understood. Uh, the famous story of Steve not giving Dan Kotke stock. Do you, do you understand, do you, I mean, it's never been completely explained to me. No, do I you, don't, I, that's no, just never, a, no, a, I don't a know. Steve Tick, yeah. for whatever. I mean, you know, Steve is an enigma. I mean, you know, he, what they use the word mercurial, right? And so he could be um, one kind of person and another. I personally, I never once had a disagreement with him. I never had a shouting match with him. Um, he, my assistant told me he called one time looking for me and, and just, Curse her out because she couldn't find me, and um, and when she told me, I told him, and he called back and apologized to her. Um, so I always found him really gentle. I, I we had nice conversations. He also did tech support for you. I learned. Huh? He that? did tech support for you. Yeah, he did. He um, <laughs> he would come over all the time and, and fix my computer. And in fact, uh, when when he went back to Apple the second time. Uh, this was, um, you know, in the 90s, um, we had lunch, and, and I complained about something not, you know, some piece of software that wouldn't launch properly. And he says, oh, no, it, 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 there's no problem with it. And I said, well, I'm having a problem with it. It's not where he says, I'll come over with you after lunch. And I said, no, I mean, this is, he's back at Apple the second time. And, you know, he's, the company was growing pretty rapidly. And, um, and I said, don't, no, don't worry about it, you know. And uh, so he then sent me an email, and I, I do have that email, and he said, I'm serious about coming over and fixing your computer and, and launching that application. <laughs> he said, besides that, I get a chance to see Diane again, my wife. Um, and, um, 
but he did send me his tech support guy <laughs> several times, several times. He, he would always send him over. So how torn were you at, when um, things fell apart and Steve was pushed out? I mean, you were, you, were, you, were, you were on the executive board. You were at the meeting. Yeah. And was that personally painful? Yeah, it was, ex it was very painful, although um, I had had conversations with Steve. I mean, this, this started over him um, stepping down as general manager of the Mac division. But I had, I had told him personally that I thought he should. So I, this was not a, at, at the meeting, the staff meeting, it, it, wasn't, a, it wasn't a surprise when I simply said, yeah, I, I've already told you this. Because I, and I felt I wanted him to be sort of CTO. So did Bill Campbell. Both of us were the two guys that wanted him to sort of stay in the company. I hated the idea of the entrepreneur leaving. Wozniak had, you know, had left, so um, Steve was, um, he was young, he was impetuous, he, he had a lot to learn, but he was, um, he was a driving force. And he, he would make a company successful, uh, you know, I, I just felt it in my bones. And, um, and so I, I wanted him to stay. And, um, but that whole period right there, he, I always thought he sort of fired himself. Um, he started forming this other idea of next, of another company. He, um, um, you know, he wasn't, he was shifting that whole notion of moving away from the Apple II, and, and the Apple II was being very, was very successful, very successful. And he was the, basically the marketing genius behind the Apple II. And yet, he wanted to do his own product. And the Mac was being taken away from him, and this was his product. And if you read a lot of the things that he said from, from interviews and so forth, he, this was his. This was, and, and he owned it. And but the, you know, the other thing that came across in sort of preparing about that moment, you talked to him a little bit and actually tried to persuade him to wait to start next, but yeah. he didn't. Well, there, you know, there was, a, the, the, everybody wanted to sue him. And, uh, and, and I think there was a, actually a pretty good case if they really wanted to pursue it. They did sue him, actually. Yeah, they did, Richard, but yeah. Scully um, is the one who later on uh, had dropped it. Yeah. Because John really liked Steve a lot, and I don't think he wanted to pursue that. Um, I called, I had several con phone conversations with Steve as he left, even in his car, and which um, I told him to just put it off six months. And, um, and I had talked to all of, I talked to Mark Markala and I talked to uh, uh, Eisenstadt. And I've got this all documented, as you know. This is, this is the document. I have this, this is one of my notebooks, you see all these things. This it was says, the notebook from- Steve exits Apple. Yeah. <laughs> and so I have detailed notes on all this, so nobody can tell me I'm wrong. Well, one striking- They can tell me there are different views, but <laughs> it's not wrong. So, you know, occasionally when I was, would interview Steve, I would get this sense that he was a guy who was playing chess and I only under, understood checkers. And that came across very clearly when you talked about one of those conversations where he said, I might sell my company back to Apple. Yeah. He had that vision 10 years before yeah. he sold it he, back to he, he basically, you know, and I, I told him, I said, you know, Steve, you know, if you just sort of go quiet for a while and, and put this off, then, you know, we could stop this lawsuit. Because, you know, he, he didn't, he didn't, he hadn't bought, he had not as yet bought Pixar. So he, you know, he could have lost a lot of, all of his money, quite frankly, um, in legal fees. And um, so I, I told him, uh, uh, I, I, I'd called him back and forth and he said to me, um, I said, you know, they're, they're, they're going to continue with the lawsuit if, if you don't. And he said, don't they know the hometown hero always wins? And, um, and then he told me that he said, maybe um, I'll develop a product that Apple will want and they'll buy us back someday. And of course, that's exactly what happened, but that was uh, you know, 10 years yeah. hence. Yeah. I have about 50 more questions, but I'm gonna switch gears and go okay. over to, because we're, we're at eight o'clock and I, I wanna get some of these in. This was one of them I was gonna ask you. Um, so, you know, you defined an era of marketing that I knew about very well, and the question is, do the new marketing media like search engine optimization and social networks change basic marketing strategy? Has, has marketing changed fundamentally, and is it yeah. forever? Marketing has changed, but it hasn't just been the social media. It's been happening over the last 10, 15 years. And that, and, and I, I, I give a talk on this called, you know, the, the, that IT has revolutionized marketing. And if you look at most of the traditional marketing functions, distribution used to be reported into marketing. It now is logistics. 
and it reports usually to a vice president of logistics in the company. Um, you know, um, pricing is really done now by looking at data and doing a business intelligence. Uh, competitive analysis is done through business intelligence. I, I, and, and if you think about any kind of customer support, self-help, help desks, all of this is done online through uh, information networks. So that I think probably more than 80, maybe 90% of all marketing today is really done uh, through information technology and, and, and online. What about the stuff that you, you know, that strategy of marketing that you created, which I remember being around influencers. Is that just sort of gone by the wayside? Does it, does it, is it, is it still a factor? Uh, it is within segments, but then the segments become narrower. And, and um, you know, there, there, there is that, still that, that influence. But by and large, um, all the support networks and, uh, and, and the way I look at the social media is every, the big data is going to change marketing even more radically simply because it integrates structured and unstructured data and allows you to do correlations across, you know, a tweet and a database and, uh, or uh, what they call the Internet of Things, tracking the product itself. And so all of that kind of data and information is, and, and more and more marketing is machine to humans. And that's going to increase. And so the role for marketing is going to become questionable unless they can become more knowledgeable about that. If some, this one, if something jumps to mind, um, what was the best piece of advice you ever gave? One, Apple, two, Intel, three, Silicon Graphics, and four, Genentech. Does that, anything jump out at you? Yeah, uh, Genentech, uh, I'll be a bit worse. Genentech was. Um, at that time, uh, when you did a, uh, the recombinant DNA was seen as a, a scientific breakthrough because it came out of uh, UCSF, Herb Boyer, whom I actually went to college with. Really? And, um, and, uh, and, and I actually put out a release on it and was castigated by the science community, the writers community. I mean, they really got calls and nasty things over that. But um, one of the articles was read by Eli Lilly, who called them up, uh, it was a news article, and uh, asked them not to do anything until they could visit. They came out and Lilly essentially licensed their first product, which was insulin, uh, Humulin, and uh, human insulin. And, and I'm a diabetic, yep. so I have a self-interest there. Yep. Um, and. Um, uh, that was, a, I think, probably one of the, the best things. Um, with um, with, with um, Apple, um, there was probably a lot of different things. Um, uh, some good, some bad. Um, <laughs> Intel was, again, a daily kind of thing of, of working. Uh, I, I think, uh, I'll tell you something that Andy Grove told me, which was the best advice I gave him, which was uh, the Journalists and analysts don't want to talk to me, they want to talk to you. So I gave them a list of 10 people to visit and spend time with. And I said, when you go to New York or whenever you're doing anything, you do it, not me. And he told me that's some of the best advice. But I heard that you did early pioneering work convincing New York media that there was a story on the West Coast. Well, they... uh, you know, I, I pounded on a lot of doors. I started in the 70s doing that. And, um, and uh, you know, as I said, I had I turned away. People just didn't want to see. They just didn't believe. And I have some wonderful newsletters out of, out of um, the, the analyst world saying that uh, if, a, if a new product or a new industry is likely to arise, it's going to be a division of a large established company. <laughs> and the reason is, is because no new company, this is, this is a direct quote. I, th I think this was a Morgan, again, another Morgan Stanley one, but it was a newsletter that no startup company could afford to build the infrastructure. And so um, you really ran into a wall. And that's why I started taking those people back. And what was really unique was that they were unique people. They weren't the big um, you know, institutional kinds of presidents that, that didn't actually show up at these places. So when I took um, you know, Bob Noyce or, um, or Andy Grove or, um, you know, Charlie Spork or Don Valentine and then Steve Jobs and others and put them in front of these journalists, they really started saying, these are really unique people. So that's why a lot of the people stories started arising and people started seeing them as distinguishing factors. And that was fine by me because it repositioned these companies and Silicon Valley as being a unique place.
What was the story on magazine covers and the importance of them? At one point, you told Bill Gates that that was the wrong yeah, way to go. Uh, he should just work well, on building Bill his Well, Bill was a client, and, and um, that's, that's another story. I don't know. Bill's a sponsor. I don't know. <laughs> uh, um, and this is, this is my story, so he has his own story. Um, but um, uh, Steve Jobs appeared on the cover of Time magazine very, very early. And that was in the early 80s. This is a, yeah. other than the Computer of the Year event, right? Yeah. Was, yeah. yeah. He, Steve was on, I think, nine time covers, more than I think anybody else. Um, but that was before Bill, who was also a client. And, and, you know, the one thing that was when you were in the PR business, you were sort of in the middle of all these people. I mean, Intel was in a, in a different business, but from a news standpoint, the, Andy Grove was looked at what Steve Jobs got, and Steve looked at what Bill Gates got, and Bill Gates looked at what Steve got. And they were all your clients. And so they were all my clients. Yeah. So it was, we used to have these uh, evening with programs in which I'd invite them all to a, a dinner with, um, um, you know, like the senior editors of Business Week or um, um, Mrs. Graham. We had her one evening, and we had the, the publisher of the Wall Street Journal. And the idea was that you could, you could ask any questions from both sides, but nothing could be published. And so we would have these evenings. Well, seating arrangements were always difficult, because, not from the journalist standpoint, but I would say, no, they're suing them. So you would, you, would, you would try to do it. But the whole idea of getting people in, engaged in their uniqueness, and these people are in this valley are very bright, and they have to command the, 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 the attention of, of the journalists who were looking not just for you know, uh, news about products, but news about who's behind those products. Can you share any failures you really learned from? Lots, lots, lots. Um, Intel 432, does that come to mind? <laughs> I spent a lot of time up there trying to learn about object-oriented code, I will tell you. <laughs> and um, the, the hours and hours and hours and hours. Uh, but um, no, I, you know, I didn't look at any of those things as failure because that wasn't my job. My job was to try to, to communicate about what the benefits of these products were. I, didn't, I couldn't necessarily say whether the product was a, a success or a failure. I don't think you, anyone can really predict that. But I do believe that, that marketing and technology are two sides of the same coin. And every, every new product, a revolutionary product, requires some sort of evangelism, some sort of effort to get, it educate, get the market educated about it. And that was where I worked in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. So much of what you, I saw I was doing wasn't so much in the sense of promotion. I mean, as you, as you think with Pepsi or Coke, there was much more risk associated with buying a technology product. And so I used to say, you know, at one end of the risk thing is Pepsi and Coke, at the other is heart surgery. And technology <laughs> is up that scale because it has such a high risk involved with it. So, so here's a Steve Jobs question. Would you say Steve was a, quote, natural at marketing or was his seeming genius an acquired skill? Both. He was a natural. I mean, I have an article, and I, I found it was in the New Yorker magazine, and it was back in about 1977, I think. And it was uh, the New Yorker went to one of the homebrew clubs to see what was going on in this thing, and he bumps into this guy who introduced himself as vice president of operations. And, and, and he goes on and on. He's using the analogy of, uh, of the camera and uh, the Polaroid, all these kinds of things, you know, and he's going on and on and on, and, he's, and he introduced himself as Steve Jobs. And, and, and this, this young man says, you know, I wish I had one of these tools whenever I was in school. And I says, uh, you know, back when I was in school, and the man says, how old were you? And he says, how old are you? And he says, I'm 21. <laughs> and so, and, and so uh, but so Steve had this ability to articulate um, you know, um, about the product and, and put it in a broader kind of um, future perspective. And, um, and, I, and I have a video of him talking in about 1980 about using the power of the processor to eliminate, and he's telling the audience to eliminate the problem with personal computer, and that is that you have to learn how to use one. And his, he said, well, in the next few years, we'll, we'll, we'll solve that problem. It took quite a while because the technology didn't allow it until some years later. Here are two questions that I think are kind of tandem. 
One is, if you could join any company now, which one do you think would be the most fun? And then, what do you see as the future of growth in Silicon Valley? Where and for how, how long will this area be uh, an epicenter? But so the, a company growth uh, depends on what position I need to take. I don't want to work for anybody. <laughs> so uh, you'd be CEO. I've worked for, work for myself. For, <laughs> yeah. I think Facebook is very interesting. I think they have a, a platform. Um, they they have a lot of choices ahead of them. Uh, it's they're not easy. I think that they have yet to really solidify um, that that they are a real solid growth technology-based company and not just a service on top of a platform. And it's more than like this cosmic nightclub. That, yeah, that, that, that. yeah. And, and, I think, uh, and I think the people are interesting there. Um, I, I think, you know, uh, from what I understand, I mean, I, you know, I understand Apple quite well. Um, I know some of the people there quite well. Um, and I think, um, y you know, it's, it's, it's more of the same and being pushed. Um, uh, Intel, I don't know anymore. I don't know that anybody does. It's changed pretty radically. Yeah. They've got a huge challenge ahead of them. Um, you know, and I think from a challenge standpoint, it would be fascinating to work there um, because figuring out what markets they have to, have to. I, 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 I saw in my notes back, I think it was in the, in, early 80s, the late 70s, uh, that Intel had done a survey of its customers and found out that 50% of its customers were from the industrial and the instrumentation marketplace. And, um, and yet the processor took them all out of that. And now, in effect, you know, they're, they're, they're being challenged in that marketplace because the PC has really declined at the desktop. And now it's all mobile. And what's the next view for mobile? This is, uh, we're, we're running out of time. This is the last question. This is selfish. This is a question for me. Um, can you tell us um, uh, what you can see in your crystal ball will happen in the publishing and media and editorial space? <laughs> <laughs> and will consumers find it valuable? I think the editorial space is, is certainly going to find its way online. Um, it, it's a value, and it continues to be a value. There's a lot of smart people uh, distinguishing yourself as a unique voice is really, really hard. And I think that um, um, that's going to be a challenge. I think that some of the people who have thought about multiple ways of doing that, um, my friend um, um, uh, 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 who started Fast Company, you know, he not only wrote the magazine, but he also did the, the workshops and seminars and so forth. So I think doing, turning the, the, the journalist into a multifaceted way, and Walt Mossberger has done this too, with video and other ways. Um, I think that's going to be really the future of distinguished journalists, or distinguishable journalists, I'm sorry. Um, I think the media is, is dying simply because the advertising support is just cheaper other ways. And as um, 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 Tony um, uh, Knight, or Tony Ritter, who was the publisher of Knight Ritter and San Jose Mercury News, told me, more than 20 years ago, the only people that are subscribing to the Mercury are white males over 50. <laughs> and I, you know, and kids don't read newspapers. Um, and, uh, and my granddaughter, who's a senior in high school, and a number of us, uh, my daughter's been living with me and, and with her husband and that because their house is being remodeled. And, and we always talk about what's in the paper or things like that or news and so forth. And we have these active discussions and she sits there and listens. So then the next morning, you know, she's going off to school, she's reading the newspaper, and she says, you know, it's amazing what you can read in the newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I think it's the first time that she had ever picked up a newspaper. <laughs> that's both really sad and that's but a great boy, note can to... she Instagram and tweet and all those kind of things, you know, that are, you know, instant news. So um, it, 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 we're missing something... But I'll, I'll tell you one last story, and okay. that is that the, the change that goes on. Um, my father was born in 1898. Uh, and he visited Silicon Valley in, um, in the mid-'80s, before he passed away, and took him around to all the company clients that I had and so forth and so on. And he was just, his mind was just, you know, a buzz. He had been a, um, you know, eighth-grade education and so forth. And he said, I don't know how you're going to live in this kind of a world. 
And I said, well, think about what you went through. I mean, he was, you know, essentially electric lighting, the automobile, uh, radio, Airplanes. television, airplane, uh, man on the moon, and so forth. And I said, you know, and I started, you know, when I came here with this transistor, and I'm on the board of a nano company that's doing, you know, um, quantum dots that are 250,000 times smaller than the width of a human hair. And, and I'm already there, but, <laughs> um, but you know, I, I think over the span of maybe the next 20, and if science and technology are doubling every four, three, two to five years, I don't know what it is, but somewhere in that framework, um, the young people today are gonna be challenged with enormous new, and the social impacts of it, we don't know, and we can't predict. You just have to be able to adapt quickly and to be ready to, um, to respond. Thank you. You're Please give <laughs> you a round of applause. Thanks very much. Thank you.